Welcome to Washington Today for October 17th, 2022. I'm Gary Sterikoff. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Here are some of today's headlines. Russia launched dozens of Iranian-made drones at Ukrainian cities early on Monday, including the capital city of Kyiv. The drones are small and inexpensive, but also highly maneuverable and accurate, allowing the Russian military to attack from long range. Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko said the attack caused five explosions in his city. One of them hit an apartment building. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said four people, including a young family expecting a child, were killed in that attack. We'll hear what it sounded like over the skies of Kyiv coming up. Early voting started today in Georgia, home to a series of important midterm races. And in debates for two of those races, the one for U.S. Senate between incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker, and one for the 14th Congressional District between Republican incumbent Marjorie Taylor Greene and Democrat Marcus Flowers, both of those debates had heated moments over the weekend. We'll hear those coming up. The White House has called former President Trump's comments telling American Jews to, quote, get their act together, anti-Semitic. The comments were also widely criticized by Jewish groups. We'll get the latest from White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. That's also coming up. And the Justice Department is recommending that former Trump White House senior advisor Steve Bannon be sentenced to six months in jail and a $200,000 fine for defying a subpoena to testify before the House January 6th committee. The recommendation made in a court filing earlier on Monday says Mr. Bannon, quote, exacerbated the January 6th attack on the Capitol by not complying with the committee's subpoena and that he also did not fully cooperate with the DOJ's own pre-sentencing investigation. Mr. Bannon's lawyers have asked for probation pending an appeal. The formal sentencing in the case is expected to occur on October 21st. We begin at the White House, where Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre spoke out against remarks made by former President Trump on his media platform, Truth Social. That statement said in part that American Jews need to, quote, get their act together to show appreciation for Israel, quote, before it's too late. The White House statement came after the Anti-Defamation League CEO Jonathan Greenblatt told CNN that the former president's comment Quote, sounds like a threat in an environment where Jews already feel threatened. Here's more from Corrine Jean-Pierre. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to start by asking, is the president aware of the comments that Donald Trump made yesterday about American Jews uh, basically saying that they're ungrateful and they better get their act together, appreciate what they have before it's too late? Given that the White House weighed in pretty uh, forcefully last week to the racist comments by the Los Angeles City Council members, would the White House um, denounce uh, these anti-Semitic comments by the former president as well? So Donald Trump's comments were anti-Semitic, as you all know, and insulting, both to Jews and to our Israeli allies. But let's be clear, for years, for years now, Donald Trump has aligned with extremist and anti-Semitic figures. And it should be, it should be called out, to your point, Darlene, just like we called out our Democratic uh, friends and colleagues last week, and we will condemn and call this out as well. So we need to root out anti-Semitism everywhere. It rears its ugly head. We need to call this out. With respect to Israel, our relationship is ironclad, and it's rooted in shared values and interests. Donald Trump clearly doesn't understand that either. Okay. Uh, just to follow up on that, it was announced earlier today that the rapper formerly known as Kanye West wants to buy the conservative social media platform Parler. Um, and this comes after he was kicked off of Twitter and Instagram last week for his own set of anti-Semitic comments. Is the White House or the president concerned that uh, should this sale go ahead and that Ye be allowed to buy this platform, that it would give him a, another venue for anti-Semitic comments, hateful comments, with no, you know, no gatekeeper, no one to say that's wrong or anything like that? So as you know, when it comes to these types of purchases uh, or agreements, I can't speak to that. Um, so that's not something the actual 
you know, uh, agreement or inter interaction. I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is hateful rhetoric. What I can speak to uh, is insulting rhetoric. When I can't, what I can't speak, can speak to is anti-Semitism, which is hateful. It is dangerous. Uh, and uh, we are going to continue to condemn that type of language because at the end of the day, it is disgusting. And it is there is no room, absolutely no room, no place in our political discourse to be having that type of really vile uh, conversation or comments being made. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Also today, President Biden announced the formal launch of the federal application for his student loan forgiveness plan. The form can be found at studentaid.gov. Here's more on that from the president. Good afternoon to everyone else. Less than eight weeks ago, I announced my administration's plan to forgive up to $10,000 in federal student loan debt and up to $20,000 if you received a Pell Grant for folks earning less than $125,000 a year. Today, I'm announcing how millions, millions of people working in middle class folks can apply for get this relief, and it's simple, and it's now. It's easy, it's fast. At the end of my remarks, I'm going to be officially launch this new, app, new application site at studentaid.gov, studentaid.gov. You'll be able to fill out your name, social security number, date of birth, and contact information, no forms to upload, no special login to remember. It's available in English and in Spanish on desktop and mobile. It takes less than five minutes. And if you have any questions, you follow up. We will be able to follow up with you. This is a game changer for millions of Americans. We get moving. And it took an incredible amount of effort to get this website done in such a short time. I want to thank the Secretary of Education. There he is. Secretary of Education Cardona, who's here with me today. He and his team led a talented group of data scientists and engineers across the federal government and built it and test it and launch this new application in just weeks. And the secretary insisted that it, be test, that it had to be tested over the weekend. It landed and handled more than 8 million applications without a glitch or any difficulty. We had over 10,000 people contact the White House to be either to send us letters or calls thanking us. It means more than 8 million Americans are starting this week on their way to receiving a life-changing relief that they're looking for. President Biden announcing the formal launch of his application for his student loan forgiveness plan. Early voting started today in Georgia. That's home to a series of important midterm races, including for the U.S. Senate, the House, and both the governor and secretary of state. And debates in two of those races, the Senate race between incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker, and the 14th congressional district race between Republican incumbent Marjorie Taylor Greene and Democrat Marcus Flowers, had heated moments over the weekend. On Sunday, the Atlanta Press Club hosted a debate that was scheduled to include Senator Warnock, Republican Herschel Walker, and Libertarian Chase Oliver. But only two of those candidates showed up for the debate. Here's how it sounded from debate moderator Scott Slade of WSB Radio. Welcome to the Atlanta Press Club Loudermilk Young Debate Series from the studios of Georgia Public Broadcasting. This is the general election debate among candidates for the U.S. Senate. Let's meet the candidates for this debate. They are in alphabetical order. Chase Oliver, a libertarian, is a businessman. Herschel Walker, a Republican, is a businessman and former professional athlete. Mr. Walker has declined to participate and is represented by an empty podium. Raphael Warnock, a Democrat, is the incumbent senator from Georgia. The Walker Campaign's communications director, Will Kiley, explained the candidate's absence to WSB-TV, saying, quote, On Friday night, Herschel Walker participated in and won a fair and equi equitable debate in front of the people uh, in Savannah. Unlike the press club debate, the Savannah debate was not organized by Raphael Warnock's donors. It was unfortunate to see that even in his second try at a debate, Raphael Warnock couldn't give a single direct answer. Winners don't need a second try, and Herschel Walker was the clear winner of Friday night's debate. That is the official statement from the Walker campaign uh, about his absence at that debate on Sunday night. Meanwhile, in another press club debate, this one between the candidates in Georgia's 14th congressional district, incumbent Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene said 
The Democratic Party, quote, represents grooming children and sexualizing them in school, while questioning her opponent, Marcus Flowers. Here's how that sounded. Marcus, you're a father and you are a representative of the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party is the party of child abuse. It's the party that represents grooming children and sexualizing them in school, teaching anti-white racism in the terms of CRT education and genital mutilation of kids, kids that can't even get a driver's license, can't get a tattoo and cannot vote. How do you stand there and represent the Democrat Party as a father? And do you believe in genital mutilation of children under the age of 18? And, and these puberty blockers that have severe health consequences. Time for your Because I have re- I've introduced a bill to ban it and make it a felony to, genital- to mutilate children's genitals. Do you stand by that? Boy, that, that was a lot. And God bless you, Marjorie Taylor Greene. If you truly believe that, that I'm praying for you. You know, I believe in this country. I believe in our democracy. And I believe in standing up for human rights. People come up to me every day and tell me, how they feel attacked by you. And yes, I'm talking about children and our LGBTQ plus community. Every day, Congresswoman Green, seniors, Latinos, blacks, men and women, every day, this is how she treats the people of Northwest Georgia and the people, people of America, attacks, constantly attacking. That's not representative, Green. You represent them. I do, I represent and I will always protect children. And that's why I introduced the Protect Children's Innocent Act to protect children who just may be confused about their identity. Kids need to grow up. They do not need to have mastectomies, castration, or take dangerous drugs that have serious health consequences. Marcus Flowers represents the Democrat Party and the Democrat Party is the party of child abuse. And we have to stand up and stop it right now. To protect children, we protect them from making serious mistakes that will last a lifetime. The same mistakes and regrets that many, many D-trans people have right now. Extreme examples and lies is what Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing, trying to misrepresent me. That's the time on this. Debate last night between Georgia Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene and her Democratic opponent, Marcus Flowers. In the race for Georgia's 14th congressional district, you can see that entire debate at cspan.org. And for more debate moderator moments, check out the latest episode of The Weekly. This week's episode includes 10 great moderator moments from the C-SPAN video library. You can find The Weekly at cspan.org forward slash podcasts, also on our C-SPAN Now mobile app or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Washington Today. Here are some of the live programs for Tuesday on C-SPAN Radio. At 10 a.m. Eastern, Congressman Michael Gallagher of Wisconsin, the ranking Republican on the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Personnel, discusses national defense. He's going to be at a program hosted by the Heritage Foundation. And live Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee examines the procedure for exerting executive privilege Testifying will be the Assistant Attorney General from the Office of Legal Counsel, Christopher Schroeder. Listen to C-SPAN Radio live on your smart device. Say, play C-SPAN Radio. Welcome back to Washington Today. Here are some more headlines. Just over 20 percent of candidates running in the 2022 congressional midterms have some degree of military experience. That's according to a report by the Pew Research Center. That report also found the majority of those candidates are men and nearly two thirds are Republican. The survey also found that 53 percent of registered voters liked political leaders with military experience, while men and Republicans were were more likely to view those candidates favorably. Russia launched dozens of Iranian-made drones at Ukrainian cities early Monday morning, including the capital city of Kyiv. The drones, small and inexpensive, but also highly maneuverable and accurate. They allow the Russian military to attack from long range. Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko said the attack caused five explosions in his city. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said four people in that attack in Kyiv were killed, including a family expecting a child. We'll hear U.S. reaction to that attack and what it sounded like coming up. 
The U.K.'s new Treasury chief ripped up the government's economic plan earlier today, reversing most of the tax cuts and spending plans that new Prime Minister Liz Truss announced less than a month ago. The move has put Liz Truss's government in jeopardy after just six weeks in office. In a televised address, Jeremy Hunt said he was scrapping, quote, almost all of Prime Minister Truss's tax cuts, along with her energy policy, and her promise that there will be no more public spending cuts. Here's Jeremy Hunt. In my first few days in the job, I've held extensive discussions with the Prime Minister, Cabinet colleagues, the Governor of the Bank of England, the OBR, the Head of the Debt Management Office, Treasury officials, and many others. The conclusion I've drawn from those conversations is that we need to do more, more quickly, to give certainty to the markets about our fiscal plans and show through action and not just words that the United Kingdom can and always will pay our way in the world. We have therefore decided to make further changes to the mini-budget immediately rather than waiting until the medium-term fiscal plan in two weeks' time in order to reduce unhelpful speculation about those plans. Mr Speaker, I am very grateful for your agreement on the need to give the markets an early brief summary this morning, but I welcome the opportunity to give this House details of those decisions now. Yeah. We have decided on the following changes to support confidence and stability. Firstly, the Prime Minister and I agreed yesterday to reverse almost all the tax measures announced in the Growth Plan three weeks ago that have not been legislated for in Parliament. So we will continue with the abolition of the health and social care levy, changes to stamp duty, the increase in the annual investment allowance to a million pounds and the wider reforms to investment taxes. But we will no longer be proceeding with the cuts to dividend tax rates, saving around a billion pounds a year, the reversal of the off-payroll working reforms introduced in 2017 and 2021, saving around two billion pounds a year, the new VAT-free shopping scheme for non-UK visitors, saving a further £2 billion a year, or the freeze on alcohol duty rates, saving around £600 million a year. I will provide further details on how those rates will be uprated. Oh, just let us swap this telephone out. I've just switched it off. All right. It's off. OK. Sorry, Chancellor. Carry on. It's just... I will provide further details on how alcohol duty rates will be uprated shortly. British Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt. He's also known as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaking in Parliament in London earlier today. Prime Minister Truss was not present for most of the proceedings. Other Parliament members had strong words for her, though, including these from Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I regularly say now, I welcome the new Chancellor to his place. The fourth in four months of chaos and fiasco as this Conservative government spirals down the political plug hole. But the damage has been done. This is a Tory crisis made in Downing Street, but ordinary working people are paying the price. All that is left after these humiliating U-turns are higher mortgages for working people and higher bonuses for bankers. And their climb down on energy support begs the question yet again. Why won't they extend the windfall tax on energy producers to help foot the bill? Now, it is good to finally see the Prime Minister in her place, and not, as the Leader of the House had to assure us earlier, under a desk. But, Mr Speaker, what is she left with? No authority, no credibility, no plan for growth, and it is clear to see. The people who caused the chaos cannot be the people to fix the chaos. They are out of ideas, out of touch and out of time. Now, the Prime Minister should have spoke to the House today. But we know that she cannot do that with a shred of credibility, given that the survival of this government now depends on smashing to smithereens everything that she stands for. And now she is attempting to reverse everything that she campaigned on. It is not just impossible. It is absurd. The Prime Minister is barely in office and she is certainly not in power. Only five days ago, the Prime Minister said at Prime Minister's Questions that there would be, and I quote, absolutely no public spending reductions. But after what we have heard from the Chancellor today, 
every single public service is again at risk from the Conservatives, from our NHS nurses to our schools to our servicemen and women, with the country paying the price for their incompetence. British Labour Party member and shadow uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, on the floor of the House of Commons in London. That's just some of what it sounded like early Monday morning in Ukraine as police tried to shoot down drones in the skies over Kyiv. Russia launched dozens of the Iranian-made drones at Ukrainian cities. And today in Washington, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters that President Biden strongly condemns Russia's missile strikes and said that the attack, quote, continues to demonstrate Russian President Vladimir Putin's brutality. The attacks come as the White House announced a new $725 million military aid, pack, military aid package for Ukraine last Friday, and calls have mounted for sanctions on Iran, which continues to deny supplying drones to the Russian military. Here's more from today's State Department briefing with Principal Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel. Can we get you to talk a little bit about um, the U.S. assessment on how influential Iran has become over the past few months in Russia's war in Ukraine? There has been like quite a lot of reporting over the weekend as well. I'm sure you've seen the drone attacks. How big of a role it is playing? What is the U.S. assessment? And are you guys thinking about taking action in terms of sanctions? So... Uh... To take a little bit of a step back, uh, you know, we have been warning since July uh, that Iran was planning to sell UAVs uh, to Russia for use uh, against Ukraine. Uh, we also exposed publicly that Russia has received drones from Iran, uh, that this was part of Russia's plan to import hundreds of Iranian UAVs of various types, and that Russian operators continue to receive training uh, in Iran on how to use these systems. Uh, there's extensive proof of their use by Russia against both military and civilian targets there. And you've all seen the reports, as you mentioned um, this morning, of what appears to be Iranian drones striking downtown Kyiv. Um, Russia deepening an alliance with Iran uh, is something the whole world uh, should, especially those in the region uh, and across the world, frankly, should be seen as a profound threat and something that um, any country should uh, pay very close attention to. Uh, this is something that we're continuing to monitor closely on our end, and we're in close touch uh, with our allies and partners, uh, including those in the United Nations, to address Iran's dangerous proliferation of weapons to Russia. Uh, and anyone doing business with Iran that could have any link to UAVs or ballistic missile developments or the flow of arms from Iran to Russia should be very careful and do their due diligence. Uh, the U.S. will not hesitate uh, to use sanctions or take actions uh, against perpetrators. Uh, I don't have specific actions to read out or preview, but this is something that uh, we're continuing to pay very close attention to. Principal Deputy State Department spokesman Vedant Patel at today's State Department briefing. And Reuters is reporting that fragments of one of the drones used in the attack had the words for Belgorod on it. That's also the name of a Russian border city that's been attacked several times since Russia invaded Ukraine. On Sunday, Chinese President Xi Jinping opened the Chinese Communist Party Congress. He talked about the party's political successes and highlighted a focus on military development. He also spoke about China's relationship with Taiwan. We will continue to strive for peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and the utmost effort. But we will never promise to renounce the use of force and we reserve the option of taking all measures necessary.
The wheels of history are rolling on towards Chinese reunification and the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Complete reunification of our country must be realized, and it can without a doubt be realized. President Xi's statement drew this reaction today at the State Department. Here's more with Vedant Patel. President Xi said, um, you know, China will never promise to renounce the use of force and we reserve the option of taking all measures necessary. Um, and also the U.S. military officials have said that, said that uh, China wants to have the capability to in invade Taiwan by 2027. So considering these circumstances, um, does the State Department feel a need to speed up um, delivery of weapons to Taiwan? And if so, um, what could be the options for United States government to speed up uh, weapons production and also uh, delivery, of, delivery of those um, weapons to Taiwan? Uh, I'm not going to speculate or preview any kind of arms transfer, but what I would say is that uh, we would find any unilateral change to the status quo from either side uh, deeply troubling. Uh, as we have said previously, you know, our one China policy has not changed. Uh, it is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, and the six assurances. Uh, we expect that cross-strait differences to be resolved peacefully, but I'm not going to uh, preview or uh, hypothesize anything beyond that. Principal Deputy State Department Spokesman Vedant Patel at today's briefing. You can see all of that briefing at cspan.org. Finally, this week marks 60 years since the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis a time when many historians say that the world came the closest it's ever been to an all-out nuclear conflict. On the morning of October 16, 1962, President Kennedy was shown photographs taken by a U-2 spy plane of Russian missile sites in Cuba. And yesterday on C-SPAN, Mark Silverstone, University of Virginia Miller Center's presidential recordings chair, talked about the photos and what happened next. They revealed the existence of Soviet ballistic missiles that were capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And that was a really dangerous thing, especially since President Kennedy, uh, twice the previous month, said that if the Soviets had decided to place offensive weapon systems in Cuba, uh, the gravest issues would arise. So Kennedy had essentially laid down his red line twice, uh, once on September 4th, because there was chatter in Washington that the Soviets were bringing missiles into Cuba, and there were pictures revealing that they were. Those missiles happened to be surface-to-air missiles, but what was really dangerous were the ballistic missiles that could uh, land on the United States, and there were two kinds that the Soviets were trying to bring in. Medium-range ballistic missiles with a radius of about 1,100 miles or so, and intermediate range ballistic missiles, which would have covered almost the entire United States. And so when Kennedy was shown pictures of these likely installations that were going up on the 16th of uh, October, 1962, uh, that was gravely concerning. And so he decided to gather together the senior most officials in his government, defense, state, intelligence, as well as others who he was particularly close with, to try to figure out what to do about it. And fortunately for Kennedy, he was able to keep this under wraps for roughly a week. So it was a Tuesday when he found out Kennedy would not go public with this information until the following Monday when he delivered this televised address to the American people, laying out what the Soviets had done and what he proposed to do about it which was to impose a blockade of Cuba in an effort to try to get those missiles crated and then uh, moved out of, uh, off of, of Cuba. That's, a, that's a, a tough ask. And so for the next several days, from the 22nd all the way up to the end of the crisis on October 28th, there was a lot of diplomatic wrangling, threats, bargaining, back-channel diplomacy to try to figure out how to get the weapons off and what to give Khrushchev essentially in return as a diplomatic bargain. University of Virginia Miller Center Presidential Recordings Chair Mark Silverstone on C-SPAN's Washington Journal yesterday. You can see the entire segment at C-SPAN 
facebook.org forward slash Washington Journal. And C-SPAN's Presidential Recordings podcast has a bonus episode on the Cuban Missile Crisis. You'll hear calls between President Kennedy and his senior advisors and also between the president and his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower, plus historical context from another uh, official from the Miller Center, presidential historian Barbara Perry. That's on C-SPAN's Presidential Recordings podcast. You can find it at cspan.org forward slash podcasts on our C-SPAN Now mobile app or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's also where you can find this program if you missed any of it. You can also, uh, that address is cspan.org forward slash podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also get more on the stories that are shaping Washington every day by subscribing to C-SPAN's evening newsletter. Word for word, just go to cspan.org forward slash connect to subscribe. I'm Gary Sterikoff. Thanks a lot for listening today to Washington Today. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every day we're taking your calls live, on the air, on the news of the day, and we'll discuss policy issues that impact you. Coming up Tuesday morning, the Washington Examiner's Anna Giratelli discusses border security and the decision by more than 20 states to send National Guard troops to the U.S.-Mexico border. Then journalists and husband and wife team Peter Baker and Susan Glasser talk about their new book, The Divider, Trump in the White House, 2017 to 2021. Watch Washington Journal live at 7 Eastern Tuesday morning on C-SPAN or on C-SPAN Now, our free mobile video app. Join the discussion with your phone calls, Facebook comments, text messages, and tweets.